Paul Feyerabend uh, is actually my academic grandfather. Um, my advisor was a, uh, one of his last students, in fact. But I discovered Feyerabend long before I met my thesis advisor, Neil Thomson, and so uh, I don't feel obliged to agree with him, and I actually don't. Uh, Feyerabend was influenced by German idealism, as most German-speaking philosophers were, and it's a bit of a philosopher's conceit that people have self-contained worldviews that just simply don't overlap. Uh, one of my philosophical heroes, I'm sorry, we, we have an Australian <laughs> interruption here. One of my philosophical heroes was Ludwig Wittgenstein, and Wittgenstein pointed out that people can communicate if they share a form of life. And what is the form of life we all share? We're all human beings. We share an enormous amount uh, of fundamental contact with the world in virtue of being human. Uh, just like we share a, a considerable amount with uh, birds and other animals because we're about the same size, we're dealing with the same elements of the environment and so on. So a lot of communication is possible between people who believe different things and in particular uh, between uh, scientists. So yes, there may not be a shared scientific method, but we're all dealing with pretty much the same part of the world and our conceptual commitments don't really interfere with that. So uh, in that respect, I'm, uh, I'm not fond of people who argue that there are paradigms or worldviews that uh, set all of the criteria by which we can determine if something is good or bad science. Uh, and, and I think Feyerabend was, was actually misled. Um, I once gave a talk in which I asked the question how such a humanistic person could be so fundamentally mistaken about claims about creationism and homeopathy and things like that, when um, he knew quite a bit about science and knew that, in fact, there was no real evidence for these things. He also, for example, argued that astrology was a kind of science, uh, which is a claim that was repeated recently in the Dover trials on intelligent design by Steve Fuller, he claimed that astrology was a nascent science. Now, here's my problem with that. Astrology as it now exists has been around for about two and a half thousand years, ever since it moved into the Greco-Roman world uh, via Turkey from uh, Persia. And in all that time, despite an elaborate um, inferential set of techniques, uh, mathematics, observational accuracy and so forth, it's managed to do precisely nothing. So just as I said before about creationism, there is an outside chance that astrology might one day deliver something, but I wouldn't bet on that either. And in fact, um, it's just contrary to fact on everything else that we know. So for astrology to be uh, a real science, we'd have to abandon all of our existing knowledge of physics all of our existing knowledge of uh, astronomy. Uh, it just wouldn't make sense. So when Feyerabend says uh, this is potentially a science, I think what he's doing is playing a little game with his hearers, and he wasn't averse to doing that, uh, where he says, imagine for the moment that we don't know any of the other science, right? then astrology could potentially be a science. And I think this is also true of the other examples that he used. For example, creationism. Right? For creationism to be true, everything that we know about geology, about astronomy, about physics, about biology, about history, about oceanography, about um, you name it, basically, we would have to abandon all of that for creationism to be true. Um, I mean young earth creationism, the sort of thing that you hear people saying this is what the Bible tells you. Uh, when in fact um, even people who believed in something like creationism prior to the modern uh, era um, were prepared to give these commitments up if science showed otherwise. All through the history of the Christian church and to a lesser extent Islam and Judaism, whenever science has shown something in the sacred writings, 
to not be literally possible, like the earth having four corners or standing on pillars in space or the heavens being an iron or brass or bronze dome, which had holes in it through which the water came. As soon as science has shown that not to be true, they've given it up as literal truth. Um, so the idea that creationism itself might somehow be true and might be science, I think it's just an absurd view, and I have no idea why Feyerabend thought that was worth saying. Oh yes, the famous poker incident. Um, apparently uh, Popper was visiting Wittgenstein at Cambridge and uh, they were having a heated discussion. Wittgenstein, being a little bit absent-minded, was poking the fire and had a poker, fire poker in his hand and he's waving it around as they're arguing. And uh, he says, tell me one moral claim that is true. And Popper replied, you should not threaten visiting lecturers with pokers. Um, I'm not sure that's a very deep philosophical point, but it was very funny at the time. Um, but yes, Popper and Wittgenstein represent, I think, two quite distinct approaches to um, epistemology and metaphysics. Um, for Popper, you could make uh, hard and fast claims about these things. For Wittgenstein, you couldn't because it wasn't quite so clear cut. Um, and as I said, for Wittgenstein, you, you had what was called a form of life. Now, he thought that cultural differences, for example, the use of magic in Nigeria, uh, was a different form of life. But, I mean, the point that I was making before is it's not a totally different form of life. If I go there and talk to people who practice magic in Nigeria, I'm going to share uh, same sorts of attitudes towards children. Um, I'm going to think that it's important that you raise them well and feed them well. I'm going to think that it's uh, not a good thing to uh, be uh, violent to other people and these are things that come from our shared humanity so I've actually got an enormous amount of common ground before we start to talk about magic um, I'm not a rationalist like Popper but neither am I an irrationalist like many of the people on the Wittgensteinian side of things can sometimes be um, and I think that um, Popper has a standard of what is rational that's too high for any human to, to hold and the Wittgensteinians have a view of rationality that's too low for it to be classed as rationality. So I'm somewhere in the middle there. Uh, consequently, I please nobody and I deserve what I get.